Okay. Here we're back on. Let's let's get started again. Okay, let's continue. We share my screen again. Here we go and thank you. Uh, get that back. Okay. So the first person you do need to know about him. Okay, I know I didn't mention him in, in the CAPS requirements, but we're gonna do him later in this year. We're gonna learn about him. And this is Gregor Mendel. And genetics, the, the study of genetics is based on his research. And um, basically uh, when, we, when we work with the way that he sees genetics, we're gonna talk about Mendelian genetics or the principles of Mendel. And when we do the principles of Mendel, you're going to, uh, let me just quickly close this and leave. Okay. When we do the um, genetics, we're going to work with the principles of Mendel or the laws, Mendelian genetic laws. Okay. So he was a monk and he worked with pea plants. Uh, so he had, uh, saying he was a monk, it means he had too much time on his hands. So he, he did a bit of gardening. And he worked specifically with pea plants. And when he worked with pea plants, what he discovered is there's certain features that gets carried on from one generation to the next. And he specifically worked with features that could either go the one way or go the other way. For example, in our examples over here, we see over here that there's some yellow peas and there's some green peas. And what he did is he crossed the two plants, the one with the green peas, he crossed with the one with the yellow peas. And in the next generation, uh, he saw, okay, but there's only yellow peas. And then he crossed the yellow pea with the yellow pea. And then he found that there's one with green pea and there's three of them with yellow peas. And then Mr. and Mrs. P got into a big fight because I said, Mrs. P, uh, Mr. P accused Mrs. P of sleeping around because he's not yellow, she, uh, she, he's not green, she's not green, but they have a green kid. But what he discovered is it was a, what we call a recessive gene. And so he worked with a lot of these features. One of the features was the, the flower color, the, the shape of the, the pea pots were all different factors that could either go the one way or go the other way and he crossed him over and over and he did a lot of research in genetics and so he was actually the one to discover genes but he didn't know about dna that was only discovered in 1874 by frederick mentor and you do not need to remember frederick mentor but he discovered dna and then later in 1920 uh, they said, okay, DNA consists out of proteins and DNA is what controls the genes. That is where the genes are. The genes are inside the DNA. Then in 1928, okay, and uh, Frederick Griffith then said, okay, but DNA is not only proteins. It consists also out of a fat part and it consists out of a protein part and it consists out of a sugar part. Uh, and so he, he did a little bit of background work on that, but you do not need to remember him. So did uh, Oswald Avery, okay, but you don't need to remember him. You also don't need to remember Erwin Chagoff, but you do need to see a link that is happening over here. Okay, so what happened is Erwin Chagoff, he discovered, but the amount of adenine and the amount of thymine is always equal amounts inside the DNA. And the amount of cytosine and the amount of guanine is always the same amounts. And that's going to be very important because one of the scenarios that Francis, uh, uh, that Watson and Crick had is that they, they didn't know is DNA a double helix? or is it a triple helix? But if it was a triple helix, then I couldn't have equal amounts of these numbers. Then it would have been an odd amount. 
and it wasn't an odd amount. There was always the same amount of cytosine and guanine, always the same amount of adenine and thymine. And so it had to be a double helix to be able to do that. Now, in the next slide actually comes the whole drama of this, of the discovery of DNA. So now we know there's genes. The genes carry the hereditary information and the genes are inside the DNA. But we don't know what the DNA looks like yet. We know there's a protein part. We know there's a sugar part. We know there's a phosphate part. Um, but how does it fit into the cell? It's two meters long. How the hell can it fit into a cell if it's two meters long? And so in 1952, Rosalind Franklin, who was working with X-ray photos of DNA, she took X-ray photos of DNA, and there's one. Um, she actually got a photo of DNA, and it showed, it looks like a corkscrew from the top. And so now she said, ah, but that's a helix. And so what we, what we then said, the only thing she didn't know, she didn't know was it a double or a triple helix. But then her professor, the guy in charge of her research, Professor Maurice Wilkins, he goes and he shows the photo of that that she's taken without her permission. He shows it to some other researchers. He shows it to James Watson and Francis Crick. And they link the dots together. They, they, they connect the dots. And they say, oh, but this is a helix. And because of the work that was done by Erwin Chagall, that we know adenine and thymine and guanine and cytosine are of equal amounts, we now know that this is a double helix. It's a double helix, okay? And they then made a 3D model of it, and it was actually quite comical because their professor said to them, please stop building models. You're not model makers. But they were right when they built this model. They actually had the, the correct structure of DNA, and they could show it in this model. And then the drama part. In 1962, what James Watson, Francis Crick, and Maurice Wilkins, they get the Nobel Prize. I'm going to give you a, a chance to ask now who I'm. But Rosalind Franklin doesn't because she died of cancer, which is actually ironic because cancer is a disease of DNA. And she died because of the x rays pictures she took of DNA, and because of that, she never got the Nobel Prize because it's never awarded after death. It's never awarded posthumously. Okay, before we continue, we finish almost with the structure of, uh, with the history of DNA discovery. Um, Ruan, your question? So who theorized uh, the structure, the helix structure of DNA first? Okay, so who theorized it? It would have been Rosalind Franklin. But if you say double helix, it's Watson and Crick. Because uh, um, Rosalind Franklin didn't know whether it was a double helix or a triple helix. She just saw that it was a helix. And that I'm glad you're asking that question in such a way. Because this is normally ending up in short questions, and it's normally only two or maybe maximum four marks, but they trick everybody. And so you've got to ask, you've got to read the question very carefully. They're going to ask you, who took the first photo of the helix of DNA? That was Rosalind Franklin. But who was the first to theorize the double helix? That was James Watson and Francis Crick. And so they twist the words of that question so that we, we can't answer that. You know, it's, it's difficult to, they try to trick you. They also say to you, in that A and B, A only, B only question, they say, say to you, uh, who theorized the double helix? And then they say, James Watson for A, and they say Maurice Wilkins for B. Was Maurice Wilkins one of those that theorized the double helix? No, he was the one that took the photo from Rosen and Franklin 
and gave it to James Watson and to Francis Crick. So um, they always twist that. So know, know the dynamics behind this relationship. Know who discovered what between Rosalind Franklin, Maurice Wilkins, James Watson, and Francis Crick. Know who played what part during this discovery to answer, because I know I say it's only two marks, but you know what, for you guys, you're going for a 90, 95, 96%, maybe even 100% at the end of the year. That would be so amazing. And, and uh, there's some of you that's completely capable of that. Um, but that, that's the type of question that's going to trick you. That's going to make a difference between maybe a, a 95 or a 94 or an 89 and a 90%. Okay. Okay, so that's the history behind uh, the double helix discovery of DNA. Um, later on, uh, we find that James Watson di uh, directed the Human Genome Project. What is the Human Genome Project? It's shown over here. Um, the Human Genome Project is actually a, uh, they, they decode the whole code of the human DNA. And this is what this is, it's the, the human DNA code. It's a part of the human DNA code. And you can see it's a complementary code. So that's why it's in rows of two, because the one, it's a double helix of DNA. Okay. And then uh, the whole human genome was um, mapped in 2003. So we actually know what human DNA looks like. Every little A, A, C, C, T, G, G, C, C, T, A, A, A of the human we know. Okay, let's get back to the structure of DNA. Now we're going to go into the structure of DNA, but we're going to go into it in a bit more detail. We now know it's a U, it's a double helix. It fits into the nucleolus. It consists out of nucleotides. Let's take a look at what the nucleotide looks like. Okay, so structure of DNA. It's a giant molecule. It's what we call a polymer. Polymer, it consists, and there, there's another trick question in here that they ask you. They say to you, the nucleus, how many DNA molecules does it have? It contains one DNA molecule of two meters long. One molecule, because it's one long string. It's all connected together. Okay, and but now we can split up into 46 different chromosomes, and each chromosome contains one molecule, a shorter molecule than in the chromatin material because one split into 46, but still 40, uh, still um, it's one molecule split into 46 molecules. So one single chromatin is, um, is actually also a single DNA molecule. Okay. Twist it into a double strand. It's, we call it a double helix. It's got a ladder structure, so it's got a phosphate sugar backbone on each side, and then it's got nitrogenous bases on the inside that are connected together. And um, the the monomer is called the nucleotide. What does the nucleotide look like? Do you need to know that? No. Please don't go and study that. Nobody's going to ask you to draw that structure. But they can ask you questions about the simplified structure over there. And that's what they mean by a stick diagram that you need to know. So what does it consist out of? It consists out of a sugar, a deoxyribose sugar. That's where the D comes from. Deoxyribose nucleic acid. And so it basically what we mean by that is that what we find with RNA, RNA has an oxygen on all of these um, around on the side, connected up, and then a hydrogen that's connected on top of that, like there, like there. But what we find with, um, with DNA is there's one less oxygen, that the one oxygen falls away. So that's why we say deoxy without the oxygen. So deoxyribose nucleic acid. Okay, so there's the sugar. Then we have a phosphate and we have a nitrogenous base, which can be A, T, C, um, G. And in the case of RNA, uh, the 
e u you see over there replaces the t the thymine we do find that adenine and guanine are larger molecules we call them purine bases and we do find that cytosine and thymine are smaller and we call them pyrimidine bases okay so let's see how they fit together so here we go there's one nucleotide there's a second nucleotide there's a third nucleotide that nucleotide over there has there's its nitrogenous base which is c it connects up with G. Please also notice that C and G connects up with three hydrogen bonds connecting them together, and A and T connects up with two hydrogen bonds connected together. They would commonly make a drawing like this, where we can see that A, get another pen here, A can fit into T, and G can fit into C. So that's common, a common way of drawing it is by giving it a shape so that we can see that A and T can fit together and that G and C can fit together. Okay, so there's complementary base pairing, A connected to T, adenine to thymine and C to G, cytosine to guanine con connects together. And between G and C, there's three hydrogen bonds and between a and T, there's only two hydrogen bonds. Okay, now, nucleotides repeat themselves many times. So you would typically get a code like A, A, C, T, G, G, A, A, T, T, C, 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 A, A, C, C, T, A, C, D. And this repetition creates a code. Every three nucleotides, one, to these three nucleotides forms what we call a base pair, a base pair. And that base pair is going to become in the RNA, it's going to come as we call a codon. And so that codes for one amino acid of the protein. And amino acids make up proteins, they're the building blocks of proteins, they're the they are the monomers of proteins. They are the bricks of the building of the protein. And so each three of these codes for one amino acid. And that we're gonna go into more detail when we do um, protein synthesis. Okay, what's the role of DNA? It contains the code to make up proteins, the building plan to make up proteins. Then a gene, what is a gene? It's a, a short section of the DNA, only a part of the DNA that codes for a specific protein. The sequence of nitrogenous bases determines the sequence of amino acids because each three nucleotides codes for one amino acid in the protein sequence. And DNA can also replicate itself so that the code that is found in one cell can be carried to the code of the next cell during mitosis or meiosis. And so that is why we're going to go through DNA replication in the next lesson. People, in DNA, there's also a large amount of DNA, about 98% of the DNA, that codes for absolutely nothing okay i hope you heard the pause there that was for that was for dramatic effect that means nothing okay only about two percent of the dna actually codes for proteins the rest of the dna is non-coding non-coding dna they used to call it junk dna but later they discovered that it's very important in in switching on certain parts of the dna and switching off other parts of the dna when it's not being used and also what we find is that it protects against harmful mutations. So if mutations happen in 98% of the 98% that goes for nothing, then it's not going to have an effect on the protein whatsoever. Also, it controls the copying of genes during transcription, uh, during protein synthesis. Okay, so we have some non-coding DNA. 
Okay, people, let me quickly check. Um, guys, uh, you can now ask questions. We have a few minutes. We, you can ask questions. You can also, if you don't want to hear your voice over the computer, you're also welcome to then uh, put it in the chat box. Uh, so, yes. So, should we do Miss Barry's work or your work? Okay. Now? Uh, for the afternoon lessons, there's going to be certain tasks that you guys are going to have to do that's for Mark that both groups are going to do. I suggest that um, you stick to, um, because I'm teaching you in the afternoon, stick to how I am doing it and do my work that I give you in your books. If there's any tasks that you have to hand in and the others are handing in, then try to hand those in with Mrs. Barry. Um, so if there's any specific tasks that's being handed out that you have to hand back, please do hand that to Mrs. Barry. Um, but overall, I am taking responsibility for you guys. The afternoon class, I'm taking responsibility for you. Go through my Google Classroom. You can get extra resources from Mrs. Barry. I don't mind. But you do the tasks in my Google Classroom. You do the past papers in my Google Classroom. Uh, so please stick to, uh, stick to what I am doing with my grade 12 group because then I know what you guys are doing. Um, and okay, I know so. what's required. Then I know and you know what's required of you. Okay. And so when will we catch up to Ms. Barry? Um, Mrs. Barry's group is actually on, I saw she posted work on reproduction today. Um, so uh, basically in about two weeks time, we're gonna be on the same level as them on the same topics. Then I would have caught up with where, uh, whatever section it is that she's doing. That said, please do remember that I took a look at, um, and I took a look at, at some of the things today. Um, she's not doing live lessons at the moment at all. She's only starting with that next week. So although she's posted the notes and she's given the work, she hasn't actually physically discuss the work with them. I've actually now physically discussed the work with you. That's it. Also, let me just get back to my Google Classroom. I want to show you one more thing on my Google Classroom. Guys, the whole year's work uh, is here. So before you... The whole year's work uh, is... Um, I'll answer your question now. The whole year's work is here. From lesson one up to the end of the year is here. All the videos are here. Please also go to the extra resources on here. Go watch the videos under every lesson. Not necessarily my videos, but the extra videos, the animations. Those are very nice for you to help you understand the work. Okay, ma'am, your question is? Uh, so can you please go back to that um, PowerPoint? I want to ask you a question yeah, on sure. the... Um, the, um, the thingy the nitrogenous stuff. Nitrogenous basis, yes. Uh, can, you please, can you please go up a little? There we are, these ones or the other one? The other ones where you have the diagram. Those ones or that one. Remember, you never have to remember that one. You have, that's the nitrogenous base. That is the sugar, that is the phosphate. So you see where the... Yes. So, so why between the AT and the uh, G, CG? Yes. Why is it just one bond, not um, like actually... two bonds and then three bonds? Okay, so there's a why not just one bond? Because that gives, um, you see, um, the, the way the connections are, it's like a two-point and a three-point plug. Um, I'm going to just stop my sharing for the moment and show you something. Yes. Okay. So, um, and switch on my video. So, don't be, don't be scared when I switch on my video now, because you might see my face for a second. Uh, 
Okay, there we go. Hello. Okay. So, <laughs> um, I'm going to go on these. See that plug? Can I put a, yes, um, I put a three point plug in there? I can put a three point plug in here. There's my three point plug. It's got three points. See? And I can put it into a three point plug. Okay. But can I put a three point plug in today? No, I can't because it's a two point plug. You see? And that's the same with the DNA. I can't if I no. have, three, if I've got three hydrogen bonds, I can't switch a two hydrogen Are you breaking bond. up? Uh, I think your internet connection a bit slow because you're breaking up from your side as well. Let me switch off my video, then it takes less data. Okay. So I can't, um, uh, hopefully that's not better because we don't have video on. We can't put, okay. We can't put a three point plug. Um, so we need three hydrogen bases, three fits to three, two fits to two. So A and T uses the two point plug and C and G uses the three point system. Okay. And we can't fit a three point into a two point. And that's why we have that. Okay. Okay, thank you, sir. Okay, I'm checking the chat box quickly. Um, just share my screen, my sharing my screen. There we go. Okay, chat box. Any more questions in the okay, guys? Any more questions? I'm just giving a minute or so for any more questions. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay, so in the beginning you said that could you just repeat what you said about the textbook, sir? Okay, so what, what I want you to do from the textbook is use, um, in my Google Classroom, I've got this one that I loaded up for you guys. This Mind the Gap one, okay. So the Mind the Gap one is the one I want you to use. So use this one, use the Mind the Gap. If you've completely gone and exhausted Mind the Gap, if you've gone through the whole Mind the Gap notes and you've covered all the notes and you feel that you need more. Now, we're not going to do all the notes in Mind the Gap. We're going to like this first section is how to study. Trust me, you guys at HP know how to study. Okay. But after that, there's this, there's the notes. And after you've exhausted the notes on Mind the Gap and you feel, okay, I desperately need something more. If you want something more, I'll, um, the best book to use would be the answer series. Now, Make that a bit smaller. Okay, so if you feel that you need some more guidance, you can get the answer series book. Um, just please remember that if you're going to get an old one, that it's the same material, but the topics have shifted around between the papers. So just be careful of that. Um, but um, the answer series book, it, it's a decent book. I love that book. I love the way that the notes are set up, um, but only after Mind the Gap. Start with Mind the Gap, and then if you need more, you go to answer series. Okay, so and um, I have a Mind the Gap book with me, but it's quite old, like 2014, okay. 2013. Yeah, no, it is. That's when CAPS was reviewed. Um, it should be the 2014 one. Uh, there was one that was published in 2012. Then it was amended a little bit, and the newest one was 2014. But yes, that's the book that they are using. That's the one with the materials. I'm thinking that there's going to be, it's not going to be long before they bring out a new, new one. Um, so again, the topics have shifted around, but um, it's the same topics you guys are covering. It's just in which paper it is that's going to make a difference. Um, so you can use the PDF copy as well. Um, and I, I also saw that um, there was a message yesterday from the facilitators asking 
for numbers for Afrikaans books. So um, what I'm thinking is happening is I'm thinking they're going to give another run of the books. They're actually going to republish the books this year and publish um, just more copies for the schools. So if I get some hard copies, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and distribute them as well to get, get you guys a hard copy book as well. But you said you have one already. But yes, the 2014 one is still the one they're using today. So same information, nothing left out. Nothing left out. Uh, there's going to be one or two little pointers that I'm going to give you closer to the end of the year. Um, there's one, um, one or two things under human evolution, um, under the out of Africa theory that they've added to the book. Um, that they gave us, they just gave us a note to say, just remember, just add this to, um, but that's about it. It's, it's really, it's, it's all the, it's actually, <laughs> um, I, I, I'm thinking you're worrying because there's so little in the book to study. Trust me, Ron, that's it. That, that, that is all you have to study. Everything that you need to know is in that book. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you, sir. Okay, guys, I'm going to log off now. Thank you for attending the lesson. I know it was a long lesson today, and I will see you guys tomorrow, and we'll go through DNA replication. If you have any questions, please don't, don't uh, put it into the WhatsApp group, and then I'll try and answer it into, in tomorrow's lesson as well. Thank you. Oh, sorry, well, one more thing, sir. Yes. Is that is your um, Google Classroom linked with the Sun of Park High School, or is it just... Um... No, it's not HP. It's not afternoon HP. It is actually my official Google Classroom that I'm using for my grade 12. So I'm not giving you guys okay. a separate one from the one we're using at... Um, at um, but the resources that um, that we have to use is the same for both groups. And I'm also going to try and see later, I'm going to publish all the recorded lessons from both groups. So and so, if you, yeah. No, that sounds like a, hmm? You said you're going to publish all... I'm um, going to publish all the recordings from both groups. So these Zoom lessons that we're doing, I'm going to publish them in okay. both. Okay. So will we have um, repetition of Zoom lessons throughout the year? So like there'll be two copies from last year There will be two copies. One year. copy from that I did there and one copy that I did here. But I'll, I'll see that I label it differently so that you know that, for example, let's say you were wondering about something I said that you can't remember then you'll know which one to go to. Um, that's the afternoon lesson that we had. But then you're also welcome to watch the other one that I did with the other kids. And that may be a shorter mm -hmm. time span or, or whatever. And it will be topic based. So um, it, will, it will be per lesson and pasted in that lesson. OK, so and can I? Uh... Leave the grade 11 group, or do I still need that? No, you don't need the grade 11. You need nothing from the grade 11 uh, material, so you can leave that group. Thank you, sir. Okay. Okay, thank you, guys. See you tomorrow. Bye, sir.